Okay, that's better. <laughs> My name is Ann Irving. I'm the Director of Development here at the Corbell School. And I am pleased to introduce our speakers this evening. Uh, Chris, Ambassador Christopher Hill, who served as the Dean of the Corbell School since t September 2010, will on January 1 become the Chief Advisor to the Chancellor at DU for Global Outreach and the Professor in the Practice of Diplomacy. So we're particularly delighted to have him here tonight. Ambassador Hill was a career diplomat, a four-time ambassador nominated by three presidents who served as ambassador to Iraq, the Republic of Korea, Poland, and the Republic of Macedonia. He was a senior member of the negotiating team that secured the Dayton Peace Accords, ending the Bosnian War, and was a special envoy to Kosovo, working to end that war as well. He led the U.S. negotiating team that sought to bring North Korea's nuclear weapons under nuclear control and was President Bush's assistant secretary to East Asia. His the, he is the author of Outpost, Life on the Front Lines of American Diplomacy, a memoir. He's a frequent guest on CNN, BBC, MSNBC, Sky News, Al Jazeera, and TV stations in Korea and Australia, and many other outlets. He also writes a regular column, Project Syndicate. Welcome, Christopher Hill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ambassador Hill is joined by Floyd Cerulli, who founded Cerulli Associates, a research and consulting firm specializing in public policy, community and cultural affairs, and strategic planning in 1985. His clients include major Colorado corporations, business, and civic associations. He is the director of the Crosley Center for Public Opinion Research at DU uh, through the Corbell School of International Studies. He is an adjunct professor teaching public policy and foreign policy here at Corbell. He is a board member of the Social Science Foundation, also here at the University of Denver, Corbell School. Cerulli is perhaps best known to Colorado audiences as a pollster and political analyst for 9 KUSA TV. KOA Radio, and the Denver Post. Most recently, he has appeared on NBC Nightly News, CBS Evening News, CNN with John King, Fox News Special Report, PBS NewsHour, National Public Radio, and the BBC. And tonight, this is sort of a return engagement after they spoke right after the election last year, and the topic is, is America indeed great again? So welcome our speakers. And there will be a chance for you to ask questions when they're, when they're done. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, good to be here again. Uh, we did this right after the election, the day after the election. And uh, I was at Channel 9. Of course, the expectation was that Ms. Clinton was going to win, uh, my colleagues and all. And uh, so I had about 24 hours to get uh, reoriented. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the dean and I uh, did our first presentation. And then we did it on May the 1st. Uh, 100 days, and uh, that was fun, and we had an uh, uh, excellent uh, crowd. And we thought that now that we're approaching the, uh, the anniversary of the election, uh, it would be a good time to uh, sort of evaluate uh, where the foreign policy in particular is going, but we'll also <laughs> talk a little bit about uh, uh, democracy and, uh, and, uh, and just for a moment, the election. As you know, you always have to have at least one poll or two uh, in one of our talks. Uh, the dean, I would also add <clears throat> that in terms of the Crosley Center, which became a part of the uh, Corbell School about uh, between five and six years ago, uh, a gift from an alumni uh, that graduated in 1946, uh, the dean is, I think, uh, significantly responsible for that happening, uh, both going back and uh, visiting uh, with uh, Helen Crosley, uh, but also just welcoming uh, uh, the whole program and uh, uh, integrating it into the, uh, the school. And uh, so it's been a real pleasure of mine and a thrill to do it. And uh, I thank you very much for uh, uh, being so uh, entrepreneurial. He's uh, he was a great dean. So Floyd, I think we agreed we would keep doing this until we got it right. <laughs> <laughs> or failing that, until we had some good news to report. Yeah, that's right, uh, exactly. So not sure we do, but I think we'll keep at it. 
Um, I do want to just mention, you know, these things don't just uh, happen uh, by accident. So we have a couple of work studies. Ray Ann and where's Natalie? Is she there's Natalie standing over there. Where is Ray? Ray, there you are. So we really appreciate Ray and Natalie, and uh, you know, making this all happen. Of course, with our our friends from Sodexo and uh, Ann Irving, because I think it's very important that we do these kinds of outreach. I find it very therapeutic to uh, <laughs> he does to discuss does. these things. I I, I was in. I, I was in Japan. I got back from Japan last night at 11, and I did a TV interview with NHK. And it's just weird when you know you hear yourself in Japanese. And yeah. you think, oh, maybe it makes more sense that way. <laughs> but the uh, the language takes longer to translate. So that uh, I remember the paragraphs. So when I did it, uh, they would stop, stop. Well, I, I, it's going to take me a while right. to get through that. So, all right, so I think you're going to lay out some slides, and then I'm going to start coming in when you talk about the foreign policy team, and then we'll kind of... Uh, and then we'll sort of go back and forth. Yeah. As you can see, I'll do a, uh, a little uh, intro um, on some of uh, uh, President Trump's speeches and uh, a few polls, and then the policy team. And then we'll start to go back and forth uh, on the uh, slides I put up uh, concerning... Uh, uh, Japan and China and Korea, and then we'll go to Europe, and then we'll go to the Middle East. Uh, so I think it'll be uh, enjoyable, and we'll just sort of move uh, back and forth in the discussion, and then at the end, uh, take uh, commentary, uh, criticism. We'll probably have to have a vote, uh, is America great again at the end? We'll see how that uh, uh, turns out. <clears throat> As I mentioned, I wanted to open with just one slide in, on, the, on the election. This was the slide I've prepared uh, for a number of speeches, and it, it's a, a slightly different version uh, than what I used that actual night. There's poor John King in a slight state of shock uh, with that uh, check just going off in uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin was decided by 11,000 votes. Uh, no poll prior to Wisconsin had indicated that it was in trouble, and as you know, Ms. Clinton never went to Wisconsin uh, trusting uh, those analytics and, uh, and pollsters. But as you can see, the polls actually were tracking her numbers, and they came out in 4%, 6%, and with real clear politics, um, uh, 3%. That's, that is to say, her advantage in the popular vote. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, 538 is uh, Nate Silver. Then below, as you can see, indeed, he won the electoral vote uh, by 78,000 votes spread between uh, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and uh, Michigan. Uh, but she won the popular vote by two percentage points. So within the margin of error, um, frankly, if those polls had been closer, people would have been more cautious that night, but they weren't. And, uh, but as you know, she also won by almost three million votes uh, in terms of the popular vote. The final polls, there's Bloomberg and there's ABC tracking. Th this was post the Comey decision on Sunday. Nothing wrong here. Uh, proceed with your election. Uh, came in and gave her three percentage points and in case of uh, ABC, four points. Reinforcing, reinforcing that dialogue that we walked into election night with, uh, that uh, she was uh, uh, going to win, which obviously at about, as you can see, a wolf calls it at 1248, didn't turn out to work. I just want to interject a little anecdote. June 2010, uh, more than six years before the election, uh, Joe Biden was visiting uh, Baghdad. And late at night, uh, I asked him about these reports that because of all the problems in the Obama administration, there was an idea that he and Hillary Clinton would exchange places. That is, she in 2012 would become the vice presidential candidate and he would become the secretary of state. And this was an idea to try to bring her star power to uh, the, the ticket and, and win in 2012. And so Biden said to me, June 2010, you know, this idea of her as the running mate, and this won't shock you, but there's no love loss between the two of them, but uh, he said, this idea of her as the running mate instead of me came up in 2008. That is two years True. before True. we were talking. And he said, in 2008, they did a lot of polling, internal polling and focus groups. And so Biden said to me in June 2010, he said, it was clear she could never win Pennsylvania, Ohio, 
or Michigan. He did not mention Wisconsin. I mean, he did not. But he said, it's clear she could not win those three states, and therefore they decided to go with Joe, Joe. Biden. <laughs> and so he said, so all this talk, again, in 2010, he said, all this talk you hear right now, they know the data, and they are not going to uh, uh, reverse us on the ticket. I pass that along. Is that a great right, story? Right. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, turns out that in uh, uh, 2016, those were some states to keep an eye on. Uh, the, uh, uh, the president won Ohio huge, and Ohio huge. had been a battleground state for several elections. And it was a sign, the polls had him ahead, but it was a sign he won by maybe twice what the polls were. Let's say they were 4 or 5%, he won by 7 8%. A sign that while they got it right on that state, uh, they weren't. They were missing uh, some uh, uh, Trump uh, voters out there. Uh, we're going to start with the a couple of speeches that sort of frame up uh, the foreign policy. The first one is the inaugural. As you recall, it was sort of dark. Things are not going well. Uh, it was very anti-elite. The opening line attacked all the people that were sitting behind him, uh, that, uh, Washington. You know, establishment Washington. Uh, it mentioned that for the first time, or at least the first official time, uh, America first. Uh, it talked about uh, the borders and the problem there. It talked about winning a trade, problems with trade. And he pretty much made it clear that he was the person that could get this done. I am the leader. And then the second speech that I think sort of frames this up is at the UN. And there have been other speeches. He gave a, um, a uh, not, not long, but a, a speech on Afghanistan when the, his mini surge uh, in August. Uh, and also he gave a speech in Poland, uh, which a, a lot of people referenced. It had some interesting lines in it. But at the UN, I will always put America first. He mentioned the word sovereignty 17 times. Uh, which is uh, you, you should take care of yourselves and we're going to take care of ourselves. And if everybody watches their, their, uh, themselves, there's, it's going to work out. Uh, that was the first time he used, not he had tweet, tweeted Rocket Man, but it was the first time he sort of officially used Rocket Man and said totally destroy. Uh, he, point, he thought that Iran was a corrupt dictatorship and, and the um, agreement was an embarrassment. And of course, he had mentioned uh, radical Islamic terrorism. And those have been kind of the central themes uh, of uh, the uh, presidency, uh, very, as you know, uh, bilateral. He doesn't like multilateral, not pro-alliance, very trade-focused, uh, uh, transactional. What are we getting out of it? And that, that comes from uh, uh, these speeches. And this is not a theme that's just uh, affecting our politics. This is a world, well, uh, nearly worldwide, but certainly uh, throughout Europe and in some areas of uh, Asia. But populism, ordinary citizens are being left out. The elites in Washington or wherever the capital is aren't paying attention to us. If they're in Brussels, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not getting our due. It takes a strong person uh, maybe sort of uh, uh, ignoring some of the democratic superstructure that's around um, uh, the independent judiciary, uh, free press, et cetera, et cetera, to get things done. And by the way, uh, by and large, most of the solutions are pretty much like slogans. They, they don't necessarily worry too much about the consequences. We're just going to get things done. Nationalism, we're all uh, somewhat nationalistic. We're all patriotic, uh, particularly at certain times. But it can lead to also uh, sort of a narrow view, closed borders, uh, can also go to ethnic uh, nationalism very uh, quickly, that there is some group that is most significant that's been here the longest that ought to be protected. And finally, Steve, uh, Mr. Bannon, uh, who is, uh, you see the last line uh, on this AP uh, uh, Aug or, uh, October piece I picked up. Uh, I, I am a populist nationalist, or I'm leading a populist nationalist conservative revolt, uh, which it may change the Republican Party, but it may also damage it greatly. Uh, we shall see one year from today. And there are some of the uh, people around the world that right at the moment are very populist uh, and very nationalist. Uh, Mr. Sisi, Erdogan, uh, uh, Putin, Madero, uh, Duterte, uh, Xi, and then we're going to do a, a, the, some countries in Europe here shortly. So that is sort of, this is a broad theme uh, that uh, many of our professors and studi students are, are writing papers on and taking tests on. So, how is he doing? Uh, at least in terms of public opinion, not so well. One can say, and he would argue, obviously we're, we're accomplishing some things, but this is the latest Wall Street Journal NBC poll, and uh, he had a 38 in it, uh, which was a low for them. 
Uh, I've seen 36 in the Gallup tracking poll. Uh, but notice on the topics we're interested in, uh, North Korea, a 34-51 negative. Uh, on, uh, uh, where are we here, a role as commander-in-chief, 35-53, uh, Iran, uh, Iran nuclear agreement, 24-45. Uh, so not too well. And then uh, Pew had a, it's early, it was, in, it was done in April, so a lot of the data was collected no sooner than he was in, so pretty quick. But it was compared to some Obama da data from uh, 2016. And as you can see, notice Germany is not, if you were campaigning for chancellor, you would campaign against Mr. Trump. And indeed, uh, Ms. Merkel did. Uh, notice uh, Mexico. Uh, they're not too keen on us anyway, but in any event, they're especially not too uh, keen on the, on the president. But inter interesting, uh, Israel and Russia, uh, two places where he has a little more uh, favorability. Uh, but as you can see, at least with our allies and with a lot of the people he has to deal with, uh, he's not off to a good start in terms of public opinion. And finally, and this is where uh, the dean will, will jump in because he talks about this so much uh, on all the television stations that he's on, particularly MSNBC, but many others. This is the national security team. Uh, the, as you can tell, we're uh, a Semper Fi. We've got a, a lot of Marines here uh, and a, a bit of Army, uh, but they're dealing with a very full plate, as you can see, of, uh, of uh, issues up there. Well, first of all, this is a far better team than the one he started with. Right, true. Because uh, Mike Flynn is no longer the National Security Advisor. And I think, importantly, a number of the people that Flynn brought in, McMaster has succeeded in right. pushing out. And uh, so I think there, there is improvement uh, there in, in the team. Um, the problem with his team overall is it's not big enough to handle the challenges that are going on in the world. Uh, I think one of the biggest problems in the overall team has been none other than Rex Tillerson, uh, the um, Secretary of State. Um, Tillerson uh, came to the State Department from, uh, from ExxonMobil, an enormous corporation, bigger than most countries in the world, and the expectation was that he would be able to manage uh, quite adroitly uh, a team the size of the State Department's, which is a fraction of Exxon Mobil's, there's some 7,000 people in the State Department of whom about half are Foreign Service officers. And in fact, when uh, he pitched up at the, uh, at the C Street entrance, the ceremonial entrance of the State Department, there were hundreds, maybe thousands of people waiting to, to see him. And there was a real sense that we've got a Secretary of State who's going to be successful, serious, and there wasn't anyone in the room who wanted anything but success. And so um, at that moment, uh, Tillerson, he had some prepared remarks. He had a funny joke about coming from the prayer breakfast, the, the annual Washington prayer breakfast, and the fact that they went into overtime at the prayer breakfast. Everyone kind of got the joke, and there was a sense that this guy's got a real personality. Where Pawnee went upstairs and closed the door and wasn't heard from for several weeks. Um, <laughs> he has, you know, and I, I, I you know, it's, it's awkward for me talking about a Secretary of State this way, but he has frankly failed at his mission so far. Um, he has taken on the task of reforming the State Department. Well, I think everyone since Thomas Jefferson has wanted to reform the State Department, and no one has succeeded since Thomas Jefferson. And I think the point is, you, to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, you go to diplomacy with the State Department you've got. <laughs> and uh, I think the problem is we have a Secretary of, uh, of State who has not made use of the assets he has there, nor has he kind of uh, brought in people at, a, uh, at the rate he needs to bring in people. Now, there's a, certainly an argument that the Trump uh, administration was frankly surprised by their, their victory in November. They weren't really ready with the lists of... Uh, nominees and therefore it was going to take longer. But here we are in November and uh, it's pretty clear that uh, we don't have uh, a functioning team at the State Department. And the team that we have, I mean there are a lot of people with the word acting in, in front and um, 
And being an acting, uh, you know, uh, secretary, uh, an acting assistant secretary is very different from being the assistant secretary. And so uh, when foreigners kind of look at these people, they sort of wonder what uh, the relationship is to the new administration. They maybe enjoy meeting some of these acting assistant secretaries, but they'd like to see some connection with, uh, with uh, the secretary, starting with the idea the secretary actually sent them out to do something. And usually you accomplish that by having a very brief meeting with the secretary, and then some way, it, really the meeting doesn't have to go much longer than 125th of a second. Uh, I mean, <laughs> depending on the lighting conditions. But the idea is, you know, so you go from the secretary's office, you go out to say, uh, you know, Thailand, and somehow the newspaper in Thailand has a picture of this envoy with the Secretary of State kind of getting, uh, getting uh, you know, instructions and, and uh, uh, otherwise showing that that envoy is on the team. And I mention this kind of thing because it's very clear we have a Secretary of State who just doesn't understand any of this, a little contemptuous of some of this, uh, of some of this uh, performance art, some of this theater. But the overall result is we have the impression of a Secretary of State who's kind of on his own, except for a couple of aides that he's brought with him. And as you know, he's had uh, uh, some exchanges with the President. Uh, one, the President sort of correcting him when he was out uh, in the Far East talking about uh, diplomacy and, and North Korea. And then apparently a little offhanded comment in, uh, in some meeting uh, concerning the President's intelligence level. And yeah. which is which I think also undermines his ability to represent uh, yeah. the United States. Probably the latter thing was kind of unfair. I agree. But uh, I think, uh, and the president does have this sense of humor, which not everyone finds funny. But uh, he, <laughs> perhaps he thought that having Tillerson out there um, talking to the Chinese about, um, you know, about our desire for negotiation with the North Koreans, and we'll get to some of these issues right. on why it's a good idea to say you want negotiation. I mean, the short answer is to show the people there that you're, you're, you're trying. Um, and so probably the president thought he was kind of doing a good cop, bad cop routine. Well, you got the good cop out there, but if you don't help the good cop, you know, you got the bad cop here. And, you know, bad cop, good cop, I mean, it works in police stations, but uh, it also works in diplomacy. But it works best when the bad cop tells the good cop that he's going to be doing that and they have a little <laughs> discussion. So it was pretty clear there was not a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion there. And it kind of led the Chinese, in particular, to say, well, why are we talking to this guy? Yeah. So um, in, in looking at this array is Mattis. Now, on the other side of the ledger, and the other side of the page, I think, is because uh, I'm the only one here who can't see these <laughs> things. And, you know, I have an emerging cataract, and I'm having trouble with that over there. But anyway, so is you got Tiller, so you got Mattis. I'm exactly. Like, All right. Exactly. So <laughs> Mattis has been a very strong Secretary of Defense and a really uh, and perceived as very courageous Secretary of Defense who speaks his mind, who is loyal but nonetheless speaks his mind. And sometimes right. he's, he's differing with the President, but no one gives him a hard time about the fact that it's a little different from the President. So how does he pull it off? And the answer is, um, you know, it's not true what they say about Washington, that if you want a friend, you better get a dog. Uh, you, you can have friends out there in strategic spots. You can have people in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee who are going to say, boy, that Mattis, he's a smart guy. Or in the, in the Senate uh, Armed Services Committee, that Mattis, he's good. Or you might go have former secretaries of defense say, well, Mattis, he's really good. And... Uh, or people in the Pentagon, oh, we really like our secretary. So how does that all happen? And that happens by the fact that Mattis reaches out to people. I don't know how many days in the, uh, how many hours in the day he has, but it seems to be more than 24 because of his continuing capacity to build support among these various groups. And once people like you, they're probably not going to pivot to the other direction. So you, you just have to keep nurturing that. And so the president if he wanted to cross up Mattis, would say, well, wait a minute, he has a lot of support, I'm going to right. leave him alone. Uh, Secretary Tillerson, on the other hand, in addition to completely losing his own staff, um, and 
completely is not an exaggeration, uh, thoroughly losing his own staff. He's also, and I know this because I've talked to some of his former, uh, his, his uh, predecessors, one of whom, because it was a private conversation, shall remain nameless, but I'll just tell you, he's 94 years old, and he said to me, you know, why doesn't he reach out to us? Not that he needs our advice, but then we will turn around when the press calls up, uh, calls us and say, oh, he's a great guy. He reached out to me and asked my opinion on the Middle East. Even if he doesn't care about my opinion in the Middle East, at least I'm going to say something nice because he did reach out to me. And he said, he said, Tillerson has just not figured that out. So he has no friends among his the formers. Condi Rice was one of them. Right. But when she called his office, uh, and I heard this from her directly, she said, uh, you know, he wasn't there. She left a message. And then she got a, uh, a response from his uh, assistant saying, uh, Secretary Rice, can I, can I ask you what this call pertains to? And she said, no, I'm not going to talk to you about what my call to the Secretary. <laughs> so um, he's, he, if, it's as if the Secretary of State sat down to say, I'm going to annoy every single constituency here in Washington. The press, I'm not going to let them go on my plane, unlike every, air, every uh, Secretary of State since you know, the Wright brothers invented aviation. <laughs> they've all had you know, the press on their plane with them. So he's the first. And so, lo and behold, do you think the press writes a good thing about him? Uh, or the Senate? Now, it's true he only had 58 votes, which is not good, right. but he should at least be reaching out to those 58 people. And instead, he puts a, uh, puts a budget that was kind of dead on arrival. And uh, so he's had a real hard time playing the game. And he can say, well, that's just the swamp. That's just Washington. Great, move the capital somewhere else. I think Burma did that. Burma moved it from Rangoon. Maybe we'll do something like that. But you know, it's not going to happen, and you better learn how to handle things there. And let me just say, I can't quite see, but I think you've got Kelly there. I've got Kelly right under him. Yeah, I think Kelly is going to, Kelly's in a, a situation where he better be careful because he's done some recent interviews and he's delved into this issue of whether Robert E. Lee is a hero or not. Well, you know, if you list the, uh, the work, the, uh, um, the duties of a chief of staff, pronouncing yourself on Robert E. Lee is not part of the uh, uh, job description. And so I think he, he's a person who has a lot of personal integrity. And many people, people agree with him, people disagree with him, say that. But he's also someone without any civilian um, experience. And the lack of civilian experience is beginning to show uh, okay. as, he, as he gets on Laura Ingram and uh, Yeah, on do Fox not News. do a Laura Ingram yeah. interview. Uh, so, that would be my suggestion. To so uh, McMaster, all you need to know about McMaster is he has three stars and Mattis has four stars. It's very simple. Uh, <laughs> And then beyond that, I've got uh, I've got Mr. Miller down there because well, he writes uh, much of this uh, language, which the president agrees with and believes in. But uh, he yeah. writes that inaugural speech. He and Mr. Bannon were major drafters of it. That UN speech, uh, he got most of the credit for. Yeah. Uh, so he's uh, uh, the sort of the uh, th lead thinker uh, there. Yeah. So anyway, a rather mixed team, but I would say the all star in the team is General Mattis. I agree. Uh, now, the, as the dean pointed out, he just got back from uh, a, a panel and some work in uh, Japan at uh, Kyoto. And as you know, the, uh, Mr. Abe just won a uh, significant snap election. Uh, he was up. Uh, he's going to be up in about a year. Uh, so he had about one more year. His polls were lousy. Uh, there had been some scandals. And wisely, he put together a, a uh, and of course, these can be dangerous, as you know, as the, as the British can tell you. Uh, but uh, you put together a snap election and proceeded to win it, getting, uh, he had about two-thirds and he got two-thirds. But his personal approval is not that high. It's about a 42%. So he himself is not necessarily a, uh, a, um, a charismatic uh, a person that's well ahead there. But on the other hand, he's in power. He ran on uh, North Korea's threat, China. Uh, having to be strong with China, and uh, as opposed to most of uh, the uh, leaders in Europe, he ran as a friend of Trump. You remember that he was the first person at Mar-a-Lago uh, getting out there and golfing 
uh, with the president. Uh, and as the, uh, as the dean uh, talks about, uh, he is particularly interested in the war clause, uh, Article 9 of the Constitution. Which allows, which uh, prohibits Japan from having more than 1% of their GDP in, in the military. So he'd like to break out of that. And um, I think the U.S. has by and large supported that because we'd like to have, China, have Japan together with us in third country <laughs> contingencies, whether it's in Afghanistan or whatever. Um, but we're also very cautious of the fact that as Japan builds up its military, if it goes beyond this constitutional limit, it should also reach out to its neighbors and try to reassure countries like South Korea and, uh, and even China of what their intentions are. Abe has been less concerned about the neighbors uh, as he has been about getting the votes necessary to push through this. So it may prove to be very unpopular, this idea of breaking out of that limitation, but I think it's pretty clear he's going to try. But I give the Japanese high marks for the fact that they took, took a look at our president and decided, look, he's the only American president there's going to be for at least four years, and so how do we, how do we reach him? And they basically decide they decided to get there early and often. Uh, you know, you don't minimize the, the uh, importance of golf. I mean, it's important mm -hmm. in business. It's important in politics. And so Abe, uh, has, I think, has done a very good job of kind of developing this personal relationship uh, with Trump. And where do I hear most of the, those comments uh, uh, in Kyoto the other day? It was not so much from the Japanese as from the Koreans. And the South Koreans were saying, you know, just lamenting Moon Jae-in's inability to play golf. They said, you know, if only, <laughs> uh, if only our guy could play golf. And I said, well, can't he learn? And, and they said, no, uh, Moon, all he wants to do is hike mountains. And then the person paused for effect. The Koreans are really very funny. And paused for effect and said, I'm not sure he's going to get Donald Trump to go yeah. hiking a mountain with him. Uh, so um, there is a sense that Japan has kind of reemerged uh, as the closest American um, ally in, in Asia. And I think we have to give Abe credit for that. Yeah, also, uh, as uh, Floyd, as you pointed out, the snap election. And also, he had a, an opponent who was even a bigger hardliner than he is. So. I agree. Uh, so I think he's, uh, Abe, um, this is the second time he's been prime minister. The first time ended up in what many Japanese believe was a nervous breakdown. Uh, this may also end up in a nervous <laughs> breakdown, but for now he's doing very well. And he has a, uh, another uh, uh, four years, actually five, given that his term wouldn't run out till next year. So he's going to be there for a while. And speaking of being there for a while, uh, there is uh, he with his with his uh, new team, that's the uh, standing committee of the Politburo. You know, it's, you have to go back to remembering your marks in the USSR, the, uh, uh, the, the Politburo, and then there's the, uh, uh, the Central Committee and their party congress. Well, they just had their party congress, um, and uh, uh, that's his team he put together. He gave a three and a half hour speech. The vision was for 30 years, and, and you know, he's basically supposed to have five more. Um, the great modern socialist uh, uh, country, uh, very strong on party. The party had become weak. The 89 million party members weren't paying their dues. They weren't going to their, their little speeches and to their exercises, and now they are uh, being told to do that. Um, he is definitely into the party, and it's because he gave a speech it's referenced right after he took power and made a, re uh, made a, re a, re a reference to August of 91, when the Soviet Union was in that crisis. Uh, Yeltsin was, uh, remember, on the tank, uh, and there was no party that could stop him. There was no party to yeah. assert himself. Yeah. And so he made that reference. He, he intends on being in the center stage of the world, a model for others to follow, uh, I think uh, that's uh, uh, arguable, but nonetheless, when you're doing 6% uh, GDP growth a year, uh, some people will pay attention. But his insight is that the West is dispirited, divided, and distracted. And so the, and that, uh, that's not bad yeah. analysis. Yeah. Uh, notice yeah. that these are theoretically young men. They're mostly baby boomers, uh, 
uh, sort of the middle to the end of the baby boom. That is to say there is nobody in that list young enough to really take over if they maintain the idea that at 70 you retire. Obviously, he may not retire at 70. He's 64 right now, and he would be uh, 69 at the end. So that is the new China. And the new China, it's, it's often described, and I think accurately, as a sort of reemergence of the party state. And when you talk about the reemergence of the party state, you're also talking about a disappearing of the administrative state, of the bureaucratic state of governmental institutions. So what we're seeing with this reemergence of the party state under uh, Xi Jinping is the fact that the foreign ministry has much less of a role, finance ministry, all of these ministries, except at, on a sort of technical level, have far less of a policy role. And this is what is of great concern. Now certainly Xi came in with a uh, view that he was uh, going to reform uh, uh, the party, which I think he has done in terms of making it sharper and more capable of running the country. But he also went in with this anti-corruption drive. And um, I mean, to understand anti-corruption in China is to understand a place that has become so corrupt, even the anti-corruption drive was corrupted. And so I think the consequence is that he has gone after people, not necessarily because of corruption, but because of, uh, of for political reasons. They're very, there are a lot of Chinese un, unhappy with the state of affairs. Uh, the question that we have is even though China is probably going in the wrong direction on some key issues such as uh, human rights, on uh, institutionalization, you know, uh, uh, democracy is not just about elections, it's about strong institutions that protect against the uh, you know, protect people against the power of the state, et cetera. So, I mean, the real, the real question is for us, even though these trends are, I think, very negative, the question is, is there a deal now that we could reach with the Chinese on some of the foreign policy issues, namely uh, the issue of North Korea? Uh, I agree, and uh, at least at the moment, wouldn't you say the direction on, in terms of their being tougher on sanctions is generally better, it's, they've made some... China, uh, Xi Jinping is clearly offended by the North Koreans. Uh, he, uh, you know, we'll get into this a little more when we talk about the specific issue of North Korea, but it's pretty clear that they feel um, really that North Korea has shown them disrespect. And the fact that uh, Kim Jong-un uh, essentially uh, perp-walked his uh, uncle uh, out of a, uh, a party meeting and then had him shot the next day, the Chinese took rather personally. And so uh, uh, I think the Chinese are quite fed up with him. And um, the, the issue, because even in Xi Jinping's more party state and even with these negative trends on human rights, China and North Korea have entirely different mm -hmm. systems. And China is uh, probably, even with this uh, more authoritarian bent is still probably closer to us than to North Korea. I agree. Uh, the president will be there shortly. And there's Kim. Uh, notice my comment there. Does it concern you that a, a bunch of scientists and uh, generals are always standing around him taking notes? Uh, he's 34. I assume he knows he's asking questions or... Uh, uh, making a commentary. Um, he references, uh, and you see it in literature, Gaddafi. Primarily, remember in October of, uh, of 11, when uh, Mr. Gaddafi's uh, uh, regime totally collapsed and he was killed, he gave up nuclear weapons. And so they're, they're often in the literature you see that reference. But here's something right at the end, and I wanted to cite that just because the dean has talked about it. And that is, is there a long-term strategy here just be, be, uh, besides survival? Uh, that is to say, um, uh, seeing to it that there's no divisions within the state, bringing in a, at least enough prosperity to keep the elites uh, calm and quiet. Uh, beyond just basic survival, what, what is his longer-term goal? Um, I think we are, we are in a very dangerous stage in the uh, issue of North Korea. 
And uh, I think the concern that I have, a concern that many people have, is that this is not some about some plucky little country that wants a few nuclear weapons uh, to make them, I don't know, increase their self-esteem or something. This has to do with a, with a leader, Kim Jong-un, who is essentially doing two things. One is he's trying to uh, finish his father's unfinished work by making North Korea a nuclear state. And then secondly, and most ominously, he wants to complete his grandfather's unfinished work of unifying the Korean Peninsula. And he does that through the idea that if he has deliverable nuclear weapons, any US president needs to look at the situation in terms of our alliance with South Korea and weigh that against the possibility that uh, our engagement our exercise of our alliance responsibilities could result in a retaliatory strike against us. Now, to be sure that I've put it in very stark terms, and I don't think any scenario would emerge in such stark terms, um, I think it will be much more subtle. But the issue is, even if the US is firmly convinced that if South Korea is in any way attacked, we're there for the South Koreans and would be there despite the risk, if you looked at opinion surveys among South Koreans, if you look at opinion surveys among the Japanese public, there's a concern that if North Korea has deliverable nuclear weapons aimed at the US, can we really rely on the US? And so we're seeing in, in polling data, and you've got to be, uh, forgive me, uh, Floyd, but you do have to be careful about some <laughs> of this polling data. But uh, what? Yes, sir. We're seeing numbers in South Korea of some 60%. Now, this used to be a single-digit phenomenon right. of people who think that South Korea ought to have nuclear weapons. Now, again, the reason I said you have to be careful because it's all ha how the question is asked. Right. And so if you say, well, if the U.S. isn't going to uh, defend us, do we need uh, nuclear uh, weapons? And you know, lo and behold, 60% answer yes. So. This, we need to watch this space very carefully yep. because I think it's a very dangerous situation. And for those who say that, well, you know, really, it's, they, they just want regime survival, they, they don't want the U.S. to attack them, when have we ever, since the Korean War, when have we ever threatened to attack North Korea, to come into North Korea, to invade North Korea? Um, there are some people who said we did that in 1994. No, we didn't. We didn't. Uh, that was over a nuclear issue, but we did not have any plans to actually attack uh, North Korea. So, and, and if you look at a public's uh, opinion in, in South Korea, nobody is in favor of attacking North Korea unless North Korea attacks South Korea. So this argument that we need nuclear weapons because the U.S. may attack us any time, that's a convenient argument, except that it really is unsupported by any evidence. So I think we need, to, we need to kind of be more honest with ourselves about the fact that they want nuclear weapons to create a circumstance where our, our linkage to South Korea is weakened and that ultimately they can decouple us because the grandfather's goal, the grandfather's goal was to unify the Korean Peninsula. In fact, remember he famously told Stalin and Mao that, you know, the opinion in South Korea is such that uh, 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 he, can, he can do it. And in fact, he got all the way down to Pusan. I mean, right. and, uh, we stabilized the situation around the Pusan perimeter. And so what thwarted his plans? The presence of the United States. Yeah. So my own view, and I think most people's view, is look, the South Korean army is more than a match for the North Korean army. The trouble is, don't assume necessarily that the North Koreans believe that. They may look at the South Korean, well, we know they look at the South Korean army the way uh, many people looked at the South Vietnamese army. It looked good on paper, but as soon as the Americans left, boom, that was the end of it. So this is a very serious matter, and uh, we're going to have to have some very serious thought with a strategy that can't just be one thing, like sanctions. Uh, it's got to involve a lot of different elements. One of those elements is at the moment we have three carrier uh, task force there. Just by accident, for the most part, they're moving through the area. 
but it's happening simultaneously with the president being there. So you can bet that the North uh, Koreans are uh, uh, claiming that an attack is imminent. My own view that the North Koreans, I, I mean, it, the chance is definitely greater than zero, but the idea that they would really fire for effect uh, during the president's visit, I rather doubt it. <laughs> uh, they might launch some kind of test. I doubt that too, although that's a, a, a distinct possibility. Yeah. But to start a war because Donald Trump is there, uh, I don't think that's what's going to happen. As, as you know, by the way, he's not going to go to the DMZ. Yes, you saw that? And uh, that was a, a considered... I mean, they, they thought a lot about this, and the issue was they felt that having him there, uh, it might just be too much of a red flag for, right. for the North Koreans. And moreover, he doesn't have a lot of time in the country, so he's going to Camp Humphrey, which is a, a, an ex excellent example of the degree to which South Korea has ponied up for defense. It's a, uh, it's a base that's uh, basically occupied by Americans, but it's been paid for by the South Koreans. Is it? It's this in the is, southern part. It's uh, it's south of uh, Seoul, but it's in the northern part of South. Uh, There's South one Korea. of those these polls, and as you can see on South Korea, this one had it at seventy percent. Uh, the dean said that it's uh, maybe at this point uh, it's uh, in some polls at forty percent. But notice Japan. There's probably forty or so percent of those folks that don't believe we would necessarily depend, uh, defend them, which is what gives Mr. Abe some room out there to make the argument uh, that they need to uh, increase Abe uh, their is army. not suggesting nuclear weapons. True, so true. I, I want to be clear about that. Um, let's turn to uh, Europe for a moment. Uh, I, always, I put this chart up, and I use it with my students and update it regularly. Uh, it's sort of a dashboard of uh, the, uh, the Western, uh, uh, the, the Western uh, governments in terms of their approval rating and, uh, 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 and their, sort of their next election. Uh, and the message is that it's tough out there uh, in the era of disruption. Uh, Ms. May has about a 34, and as you know, she's probably, she had that sna her SNAP election and it didn't work out, actually lost seats. Uh, and is now in a coalition government and is struggling with Brexit. Uh, Mr. Macron, while he won overwhelmingly, there still is a, was a substantial right, but more importantly, he, his polls have sort of collapsed, um, and now he's at about 34, struggling both with trying to get his own reform uh, through um, uh, the, uh, uh, the French uh, parliament, but also his proposals with the EU, because Germany... Uh, while Miss uh, uh, Merkel won, uh, she won with uh, less of a majority than she had. Uh, on her right now, particularly in Eastern Europe, where she's from, or Eastern Germany, where she's from, there is a very substantial uh, alternative for Germany, uh, a party, uh, and, uh, and she's going to have a hard time putting together a, a coalition. And most importantly, it's going to be a little more conservative uh, than it was, and hence harder to be the EU uh, sort of representative, the, the, uh, the, the person that champions it. Then there's Mother Russia. Uh, now notice that's Putin has an 81. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Medlev basically has maybe a 50. In other words, the government is not that popular, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Putin is. And then finally, Donald Trump at uh, uh, 39 or so. Uh, but it is, uh, it is not uh, easy uh, uh, leading these countries. And just to put it into um, uh, perspective, uh, they were just in uh, at an EU summit uh, in, uh, uh, I, I think, Brussels. And uh, there you, you can see Ms. May and Macron and, uh, and uh, Merkel uh, together uh, uh, sharing a, uh, a comment. Uh, but they are, uh, we now have... Uh, uh, Mr. Babis, is that how you say it? The uh, the new uh, uh, billionaire who is likely to be the next yeah, prime Babish. minister of the Babish, yeah. the, the Czech Republic. Uh, the the uh, uh, Sebastian is uh, 31, uh, and there's a good chance that he could be the next uh, prime minister uh, of Austria. Uh, these are these are individuals that got maybe 30, 35 percent of the vote, but in their coalition parliaments, uh, they are likely to. Uh, uh, form governments with uh, the, uh, uh, either a further right or even a centrist and, and in some cases a potential left. 
Uh, Mr. Orban has been around for a while and as probably the strongest authoritarian populist and done a number of things that the EU complains about and criticizes in terms of undermining democracy. And uh, how do you say uh, the uh, Polish uh, prime minister's name? Uh, Szydło. 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 And the real leader is? Uh, um, Kaczynski. Um, I make him do all the Polish. Yeah. He was there. Marek. He speaks yeah. Polish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he's the head of the party. But essentially, they are also a, a, a very conservative government. This is where the uh, president gave his speech about uh, the attack on Western civilization. Uh, critical of the EU, although I think, by and large, they've benefited from it and are still that in uh, NATO. I think they're still, uh, uh, because they sit as close to Russia as anybody, so they're still, I think, uh, supportive of the alliance, but nonetheless quite uh, critical of what they consider the Brussels elites uh, the liberals and the left uh, that uh, dominate that. So what we have in these countries, including our own, is a real crisis of institutions. Right. And whether there is a crisis of institutions or people just don't believe in institutions uh, are, is, is a function of how we kind of treat these institutions. And uh, when you have sort of nonstop criticism of institutions that somehow they're dysfunctional, in our case, the sort of collective institution known as Washington. Uh, understandably, after a while, everyone thinks anyone from Washington is bad and anyone outside of Washington is good. And so we're getting that in Europe, especially with, uh, with Brussels. Never mind that uh, this uh, whole system of the European Union has kept the peace for decades now, kept the peace in a way that no European could have imagined uh, a century ago. And yet they don't get credit for that sort of thing. Uh, in short, they get uh, ridiculed for, you know, banana, uh, you know, uh, regulations and whatnot. And so uh, there's a very negative view out there, and it's, it's, it's causing this kind of fragmentation of political right. uh, process. And, of course, the concern is that some uh, sort of uh, despot, uh, some charismatic leader in responding to this fragmented political process could bring his or her own uh, united uh, leadership uh, and uh, ultimately threaten the democracies in the even the most democratic of places such as Europe. And another similarity to America is that every one of those uh, individuals uh, ran on, uh, on the right and, uh, and the, the three um, uh, in the center all had to deal with immigration. Those on the right ran against it. Uh, closing borders, uh, limiting uh, uh, refugees, and uh, that is one of the biggest problems that Ms. Uh, uh, May is dealing with in Brexit, and uh, that was the issue that, in particular, that uh, 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 Ms. Uh, Merkel is dealing with, uh, and that is how to uh, deal with the fact that they had a million. Should there be a cap? She's not in favor of a cap, and it'd be a high cap. It'd be seven, eight hundred thousand. Yeah. Uh, but uh, should there be a cap uh, on her right, her her uh, uh, associated party would like uh, a cap. Uh, so uh, refugees and immigration, a, a, a sort of world, or a, a, well, it is a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, we have more today than we've ever had uh, before since, I guess, the Second World War. There was the, uh, the G7 summit, which was in um, Sicily, and just before that was the NATO meeting in Brussels, uh, and that was sort of the first time that the president got to get together, and he had just been in Riyadh, but he, that's the first time he got together with, his, uh, with uh, many of his counterparts from uh, Western Europe. And essentially, uh, it sort of was mixed. Uh, as you know, he's, uh, for all those reasons we talked about earlier, he's, he's not really sort of a group kind of guy. He's, uh, he wouldn't mind meeting one-on-one -on -one with people and does regularly. He's probably met more one-on-one -on -one than, than any president I remember mm -hmm. um, in the White House in various places, but the group settings, notice, no, doesn't that picture sort of capture it? He's not quite with the party. Yeah. Um, uh, in, in, a, as in, in fact, in uh, Sicily, he was in a golf cart driving behind them for a while. Um, this was also the same summit where he took the 
Montenegrin and basically shoved him yeah, aside. That's right. <laughs> to get um, into to get in the shot. Which that's another trend. Was not big news in this country, <laughs> but if you're from Montenegro, <laughs> it, it did uh, hit the papers. That's uh, true. It's true. But it made him famous uh, yeah. in, a, in a, for a moment there. Standing uh, in Trump's way. Yeah. That, and uh, and this was of course at, then at the NATO uh, summit. Uh, that's where he gave this very aggressive lecture on paying your dues, um, and you owe lots of back dues. But mainly, they had put in the speech, McMaster's had put in the speech, a commitment to uh, uh, Article, five. Charter, yeah, our Article 5, of which he took out Article of the Article 5 being the clause, the key clause in the NATO treaty that says an attack on one is an attack on all. And President Trump had stopped short of reaffirming that, making all 26 other allies saying, well, what does this mean if the U.S. isn't going to be part of a uh, collective defense? And so McMaster put it in there, and even then he couldn't do it. I noticed Miss Merkel immediately left and got a beer. <laughs> uh, she went to Munich. She was getting ready for her election, so I think she was getting ready with her southern party, which is based in uh, Bavaria. Uh, and she essentially said, it kind of looks like this. She just came right from the meeting. We're on our own, uh, which is not a bad message because, quite frankly, we look to Germany and uh, France and, and uh, our allies there to, have le to show leadership in terms of uh, dealing with the Soviet Union and sanctions or uh, dealing with Russia and sanctions and, and um, obviously uh, uh, protecting the EU and, and dealing with us. But uh, as you can see, uh, she uh, pretty clearly made it to... Uh, 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 made a, a bit of her campaign to some extent, uh, and that is that uh, we need to be strong uh, and we're going to have to take uh, some leadership ourselves. I'd like to make a couple of points, though, yeah. about what there's no question there is this nationalist uh, response uh, going on around, around the world, especially in Europe. But I think people on the other side, I mean, I'm speaking as a militant centrist here, but people on the way other side need to understand that if you're going to put a refugee camp of 2,000 people next to a German village that has had about 500 people for the last 2,000 years, don't be surprised if those 500 people are a little upset at the, uh, at the refugee camp. And then when you notice that refugee camps tend to be put in opposition territories, that is, territories con, uh, controlled by the other political opposition, there's a lot of resentment on this. So I think it behooves people who are alarmed by some of this right-wing rhetoric, this uh, anti-foreign, this anti-refugee, I mean, frankly, anti-humanitarian. You know, it, it's, it's, I think, incumbent on them not to then take the opposite extreme because by taking the opposite extreme, you just further fuel this thing. And so uh, I think the problem is in the you know, 19th century uh, poem by Yeats, I guess, was the, the center is not holding. Right. And so I think that is the concern. That's the problem. I mean, the answer to, um, to this, this effort to completely clamp down on no refugees is not to say there should be no laws governing refugees, because that is, is equally something that uh, will engender this kind of, uh, of backlash on the other side. Like South Korea, the refugee problem is not going away. Uh, there is a world of people in the Middle East and in Central Africa, Northern Africa, uh, that uh, are anxious to move north, uh, if uh, any way possible, because of the the poverty and the um, turmoil that exists there. So everybody is uh, still dealing with it, and it is a major challenge uh, for the, uh, the EU. Turning then for, to uh, the, the Middle East, uh, this is taken from the president's UN speech. Uh, Mr. Netanyahu, I never heard a bolder or more courageous speech. Uh, Sergey Lavrov uh, thought it was an excellent speech. It now means that America will quit nosing around uh, uh, Russia uh, because of sovereignty. If you take care of, uh, of course, as you know, there were, there were sovereignty exceptions. Uh, North Korea was a sovereignty exception, and, and Iran was a sovereignty exception, and uh, Cuba and Venezuela, well, these were all countries that he thought maybe they, they should follow our lead and our instructions on how they, they treat their public and how they deal with us. But in general, he was arguing 
uh, for sovereignty. And there's Mr. Zarif, as you know, one of our, our graduates here. Uh, this, is, uh, this picture is not from that uh, UN. This was an earlier picture, but I just wanted to catch him and, and Rouhani in, a, in a, uh, a shot together. And basically, he said uh, uh, both of them uh, attacked the speech as uh, ignorant hate speech belonging to medieval times, not the 20th century. As you know, shortly afterwards, uh, he has uh, uh, not certified and sent it to, the, uh, to Congress, uh, the uh, agreement. And if you were to say something, it would be that while Mr. Lavrov might have uh, congratulated him on the speech, it is unlikely that Russia or the other members of that agreement are going to agree with tearing it up. You would agree with that? Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the speech for, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the Iranian agreement, uh, the nuclear yeah. agreement. Yeah, I think the, uh, um, the Iranian agreement, <laughs> trying to be diplomatic on these things, but uh, the Iranian agreement, by agreement of the U.S., Britain, France, Germany, China, uh, the European Union had its own delegation, uh, Russia, it was decided that the agreement should just go after the issue of nuclear of, of right. nuclear issues. That is not to take on the regional problems, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's pretty clear that a lot of people are very frustrated by that. They say, you know, how can we be uh, certifying that Iran is in compliance when we know that they are, uh, uh, you know, uh, backing up Bashar al-Assad, they're supporting Hezbollah, they're uh, actually supporting Hamas as well. How can we uh, say they're in compliance? Well, the answer is they are in compliance because it's a nuclear deal. And so, um, for example, when we had the North Korea deal in, in 2005, uh, we purposely added these other elements. We made sure that these other elements were part of it because we felt the solution would require uh, recognition of uh, cross recognition of states, economic assistance, et cetera, et cetera, that would go beyond the nuclear issue. In the case of Iran, it was nuclear only. And I think uh, the president has kind of turned this over to the Congress, but in fact, it kind of begs the question well, if we're unhappy with Iran's behavior, why don't we engage in a negotiation with Iran on these other issues? We've had discussions with the Iranians. Uh, John Kerry had those discussions. Uh, I think uh, Bill Burns had these discussions earlier. But none of this went anywhere because of the effort to try to get the nuclear talks through and not to try to do these other things. So um, I'm simply telling you to go to Project Syndicate and look at my latest article because exactly. that's what I there. think we ought to do is go after these issues of Iranian behavior in the broader Middle East. We. Uh we are often optimistic that uh, these countries, uh, uh, say for example Iran and even China, will through trade and agreements uh, become a little more uh, oriented toward our viewpoint on things and it doesn't necessarily happen. I think for some extent we're, we're maybe a little naive or optimistic about it. Well, but I think ultimately if Iran uh, holds to the agreement, it will be because not only they've gotten the money back on sanctions, but they will see a value in keeping the agreement because of the, uh, of the broader um, uh, access they have to the world, and, world and, economy. And think of, yeah. besides the speeches they gave, which were a direct reaction to Mr. Trump calling them uh, corrupt and, and uh, bad for their people, uh, by and large, their response has been very modulated. Uh, they see themselves as having allies in Europe, uh, with their other partners in the agreement and just in Europe in general. Uh, and I don't think they see the president as having a lot of allies. And so they're, they're sort of playing, a, a, in my opinion, sort of a smart diplomatic game uh, at the moment. And uh, we'll see how that works out. I think out. they are, but they're also responding to how the president has essentially doubled down on a theory. And the theory is that if you stay close to the Saudis, that somehow the Saudis are going to uh, essentially jam Fatah, which is the Palestinians in the West Bank. They're going to marginalize Hamas, who are the uh, uh, more radical Palestinians in, in, the, uh, in Gaza, who have been receiving uh, Iranian support. And that somehow the Saudis, through all of this, will deliver 
on Arab-Israel peace. Um, it is, uh, I, I think it's really uh, an example of hope way beyond any realistic expectations. But nonetheless, this is kind of a cottage industry that somehow if we work with the Saudis, they'll help us on Israel. Never mind that the Saudis have never helped us with Israel, uh, nor will they ever help us with Israel because it's too high a price for them to pay. But this is the view that somehow the way to get the Saudis to help us with Israel is to do everything they want. And one of the things they want is for Iran to be put back in the box. As you know, the king uh, of Saudi Arabia just was in uh, the Kremlin uh, talking, no doubt, oil and other yeah. uh, trade issues. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Putin, I think, uh, speaking of the Middle East, there's the map. Uh, Mr. Putin has a strategy in the Middle East. And I put this up because our dean has so much experience uh, in Iraq. And also, this map is, notice the uh, containment now, where uh, ISIS is in October of 17, uh, outside of Raqqa and just sort of on the border there. Uh, not a lot uh, left. That's not to say that there aren't some incredible issues still to deal with, the Kurds and, and uh, what do you do with all the Shiite militia and, and, uh, and in general, what do you do about Syria? Yeah. What, where, what is the strategy sort of now? And there, by the way, there's well, a first picture of, all, of Tillerson uh, yeah. just arriving in Baghdad. Yeah. Um, first of all, I think the history books will record that the U.S. made a very bad mistake in dealing with Syria. It is not to say that Assad is uh, not a terrible guy. He is a terrible guy. But when we decided to essentially say Assad must go uh, without any prospect that he was going to go, uh, we created this and, and that somehow we were going to support his opposition without any proposition that that opposition was going to somehow support us. We put ourselves in a, into a position where we couldn't talk to anybody and I think created the circumstances for Russia to come in because Russia could talk to some of these uh, opposition elements and certainly was talking to Assad. Moreover, in asserting that Assad must go, you know, Assad didn't just come from the moon. I mean, Assad, uh, uh, this is a second generation leadership. They've been there for some 30 or 40 years. And the issue was, the first question is not, how do you get rid of a dictator? The first question should be, how did the dictator get there in the first place? And we didn't understand the dynamics of uh, Syria, the complexities of that country. We thought Assad was just another bum of the month, like the very rest of the leaders in the, in, uh, in the Maghreb, and that we thought that somehow this would be easy, and it wasn't. So we kind of wrote ourselves out of the equation. By the time we wanted to help the opposition, we got it through Congress, there wasn't much opposition. Or worse yet, in, instead of a free Syrian army, there were about 10 free Syrian armies, and they weren't free. Uh, uh, and so we were supporting them, but really getting very little. So I think, frankly, it will go down in history as a very botched effort. And I think the consequence right now is we're not taken seriously, nor does our administration want to even engage and so, historically speaking, we've put Russia in a position they've never been in before. Uh, our position yeah. is still that Assad should go, though, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but without, without much any of a, means to make without it Without a means, uh, not, not much on the ground, not much of a strategy. But what we did and what we have done far beyond any other country under Obama and now under Trump is we went after ISIS. Right. We, we decided there are two things going on in Syria. One, the war of Syrian succession, which looks like Assad has won. The second was the ISIS war. And we went after ISIS big time. And it is true that we've gone after ISIS in the last few months, and you know, Raqqa right. and some of these things are, have become obvious in the last few months. But the, we've been doing this for a couple of years now, oh, yeah. hammering them. So now we have ISIS out, and I think that's important for us. But uh, we have no influence to shape the peace. And it's not for the first time that the U.S. has been decisive in war and incapable of shaping the peace. And I think that's the situation we're going to have. Joe Biden, who you mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, had this theory that uh, you kind of forget about federal Iraq and rather just go with dividing it up between the Kurds and the yeah. Sunni and the Shia. Is there going to be a federal Iraq? And uh, can the country reunite? I think uh, 
um, first of all, Haider al-Abadi, uh, the Shia prime minister of Iraq, has done a pretty good job I agree. and is deserving of a lot of support, including ours. Um, he is. I'm sorry, speak a, can't speak hear? a little louder. Oh. Haider al-Abadi, I think, has uh, done a very good job as the prime minister of Iraq and I think uh, is deserving of the international support he's getting. I think the Kurds uh, terribly misplayed this uh, uh, independence declaration. I spent a lot of time with Masoud Barzani, who was the author of this, the president of Kurdistan. And Barzani always made the point to me, he said, we want independence, but we know that's not possible now. We know that declaring our independence is meaningless unless you, the Americans, support us. And we know we don't have that, and we don't have any other support, so we're not going to do it. Um, uh, Masoud uh, made these points every time I saw him. So it was a little astounding to me to see a month or two ago where he started this. And I think it speaks to the fact that uh, Kurdistan has emerged. They were part of the victorious right. coalition that did away with ISIS, but they paid a heavy price for it. The economy in Kurdistan is a fraction of what it was when I was last there. Uh, I was there in 2010. I mean, I served there by uh, end of August 2010, but then I was there in 2012, and it was still going very well. This ISIS war has bled Kurdistan white. And I think the, the, uh, uh, the fact is he was a very weakened shadow of a political uh, leader, and so he ended up uh, supporting this thing, and he got no support from anywhere. So we need to watch that space, but I don't think Kurdistan is going to go any further on this. Uh, but the question is, what is going to happen in western Iraq? Right. Will Abadi be able to reach out to the Sunnis? Will the Sunnis for once, reach out to the Shia. That's a key thing that hasn't happened. And in the meantime, and I, I like to think we need Americans engaged in that, and they're not. I like to think we need them. But perhaps that's an, it's an example of hope over experience because, frankly, I don't think we've done very well uh, so far in this. As you know, there was a debate about us actually withdrawing. Should we, we've got, say, seven, 8,000 troops there now. Should, should they leave now that ISIS is? You know, um, it is often said as a kind of narrative that no one even touches whether it's true or not, it's just sort of accepted, that somehow by withdrawing our residual forces out of Iraq at the end of 2011, we gave rise to ISIS. It wouldn't have happened if we had had our troops there. And people almost accept that as a, as a fact. I would challenge it. I'd challenge it in the following way. Since about July 2009, our troops were in uh, Reveted in uh, positions out in the desert, not doing much patrolling, staying in, in cantonments or in the desert, staying out of the villages, staying out of the towns. And I'm not sure the kinds of forces we had, they were doing training for the Iraqi military, sometimes the Iraqi police. I don't think these forces were at all capable of uh, deterring ISIS because they weren't in any of those areas where ISIS was. And if there were some small packages of troops, it wasn't enough to deal with this wholesale re-invasion of radical Sunni uh, elements who had left Iraq and then back into Syria. Moreover, and I, I think this is important to understand, moreover, Iraqis, even Iraqis who liked us, could never really say it publicly. Why? Because we were the invaders and the invaders had stayed on. So, uh, I hope history will validate the point I'm about to make, which is having all our troops leave and then come back at the invitation of the Iraqi government, which is what happened a couple of years later, at the invitation of the Iraqi government changed completely the attitude of the population toward our troops and I think uh, led the way to this, what I think is quite... Uh, historic victory over, over ISIS. And it's also possible that uh, they're winning Mosul and uh, 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 Fallujah and uh, you know, the battles that they've been in have made them a much better army. Yeah. As you know, they simply threw down their weapons and left uh, the last time. And All I right, think we, getting... we did a very good job of staying out of the camera I angles. Agree. I agree. Because uh, not far away from the camera angles, there was usually a U.S. 
uh, soldier calling in an airstrike. So we're uh, almost at the end. We want to be able to uh, take some questions. Uh, my last couple of slides. Uh, uh, yeah. One. Uh, this is one that uh, uh, I went over with the uh, the dean earlier, and this is my. Uh, uh, most scholars believe, and I think correctly, that it is this intense partisanship that is causing so much damage to democracies. People are in these sort of armed ideological camps at this point, and it's, it's not even necessarily conservative or liberal, although there's an overlay on that. It's really this is my group versus your group, um, and it's become incredibly powerful. It's spread down the ticket across topics, economics, your, your choice of media, your choice of social relations. I did an interview the other day on Channel 9 where I pointed out a poll showed that parents today are more concerned than parents were 50 years ago. They're more concerned today about your daughter or son marrying a, a person of the other party uh, than all those prejudices we used to have 50 years ago. Uh, which would be a little surprising to me if my father had said, you're not dating a Republican, are you? But uh, <laughs> uh, in any event, notice those numbers, the way they have slipped up. Uh, uh, President Carter didn't, wasn't all that popular with his own party. Uh, Nixon, as you can see, was a, a, a little bit lower. But generally, presidents have been very popular with their party. That's that first column. But notice the level of opposition now is so polarized that Democrats, are, the, the latest polls I've seen have Democrats not at 11 percent, but at 7 percent. Um, and uh, so consequently, that difference would be uh, even uh, larger. Um, and it now spreads over to, say, the media. In other words, we thought that the media should be a watchdog. Uh, we appreciated that, and I think we still think that locally. But nationally, we've begun to, to uh, uh, polarize the media and just say, well, if, if that's CNN, it can't be the truth. We don't believe it, or if it's Fox, depending on your uh, your point of view, and that is one, something that is dangerous to democracy. So you can measure the problem, but what, so what's the solution to this? Huh? Well, one solution is oh, oh, do more polling. Uh, <laughs> you knew I was going to say that, didn't you? Well, in point of fact, all the major networks, most of whom uh, are run by uh, people that I know, are in fact. Uh, committing to more polling, which has gotten a lot more expensive because we have to call cell phones. Uh, we're doing more online, but we're still doing lots of basic landline cell phone uh, telephone, and all the big polls are still doing uh, the traditional uh, uh, polling. Um, and, and frankly, while, uh, as the president would say, the failing New York Times, every time he says that, they get 10,000 new subscribers. <laughs> In other words, everybody out there uh, you on Morning Joe or MSNBC or wherever it is are in fact b building superstars out there. Suddenly we all know Rachel. Um, and we're, we're watching uh, a lot of shows that we were less interested in. But basically I continue to make the argument that while uh, uh, our, we are a bit embattled in terms of democracy in this country, it's still very robust. Uh, I cite maybe that special counsel, the uh, item uh, uh, number five there is still out there working hard. At the, lots of states' attorney generals are, are uh, resisting. And I would close with this slide. We are going to have an election one year from today. The president is at uh, uh, 39 or so. Uh, that's kind of an, the average. Uh, I use the real realclearpolitics.com average. Uh, 56 negative. So the spread is negative 17. Nancy there, Nancy Pelosi, she needs 24 seats. Can she win 24 seats? History would say with those numbers, probably. Notice that congressional, generic congressional um, uh, tra uh, question there. It's a negative, of, uh, it's, it's for the Democrats by 10 points. That's getting up there uh, to the point in which definitely 24 uh, even more. There have been uh, uh, Obama's first uh, midterm election, 63. Uh, so these numbers can be huge. Um, uh, Clinton's first election, 50 some odd, and he lost the House. Uh, that's when Newt Gingrich became the Speaker of the House. So, and if you want to see an investigation, a well funded investigation, watch Miss Pelosi if she becomes the Speaker. Uh, uh, then you will have some serious investigations. But whether, whether the Democrats win or not, and quite frankly, you have to be very cautious today, because we are, we are definitely in this, this, 
disruptive age, this, this new territory out there as to whether or not are we measuring it correctly or are we anticipating it correctly? Uh, is the, are the Democrats offering something that people are going to say, well, that's an alternative I'll take a try on? Or do they say, well, I know that alternative and I'm still not very happy on it uh, and I'll just stay home? Who knows? I think it's still very early yet, but this is the piece of democracy that is, uh, in my opinion, uh, still uh, working. So there we are. Uh, about an hour and uh, 20 minutes or so, 35 minutes. We've got some, we're ready for some questions. Do we want to use a mic? Oh, thank you. Thanks. Dean Hill, what should we be doing in the South China Sea? Um, I think the South China Sea is an example of, of an, it's an old Chinese policy, the so-called nine-dash line. It's been there for centuries. What is different today is China is unilaterally acting on it. And I think there needs to be uh, an effort. I mean, China has kind of made a mess of things with Southeast Asia. Uh, they've tried to pay them off on these issues and uh, have not been very successful, frankly. Um, you know, even Duterte uh, from the Philippines has ended up not supporting the Chinese on this because the Philippines basically reacted. They have their own nationalism. That's why Duterte is there in the first place. So I think um, what I'd like to see is an effort with the Chinese to uh, uh, not to challenge their position but to challenge their effort at unilateral enforcement of it, that is, to get them to back off. I th I, it's, it's probably too difficult at this point to ask the Chinese to go to international arbitration. By the way, they tend to lose those cases. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's a question of trying in the context of a better U.S.-China relationship to try to get them to back off and not press claims. But at the same time, I don't think we can be uh, uh, coming in against Chinese claims. So we tend not to take uh, uh, positions on these, on these disputes, and I think that uh, probably serves us well. That said, if China is going to be, you know, not only building facts on the ground, but building the actual ground, uh, uh, we can't be indifferent to that, and I think we need to make clear to the Chinese that we cannot be indifferent. I think Xi Jinping will be in a strong enough position that if he wants to, he can calm this down. I agree. Thank you, gentlemen. That was excellent. Um, could you return to slide 16? Oh, a test question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I think My so. question exactly. Well, <laughs> I know something very interesting here. Uh, the 1960 election, um, the sum of the two approvals is greater than 100%, and in the 2017, it's less than 100%. What, what has back, changed back, in the country? Back to the drawing board, then. <laughs> <laughs> Could someone wiser than I comment on the causes? Uh, well, keep in mind causes? that the, the, um, uh, that's approval, you know, those are two separate uh, uh, Which, uh, which means that there were some people that didn't disapprove of either at one time, and yeah. now... There are some people that don't approve of either. Absolutely. The, uh, you know, is, uh, the, uh, uh, is America uh, great uh, again? And uh, I think the president would argue, well, listen, we were already in some restraint. Uh, we, uh, under Obama, uh, that uh, conservative internationalism as expressed in in Iraq failed, that was a, a mistake, uh, and the president makes that clear, that we were not doing as well as we should in these trade agreements, or we were being taken advantage of in some of our uh, alliances. And these are things that you can get people, uh, their heads will nod, including the experts that watch this. But the problem for me is pulling away so dramatically to the lessons that we learned uh, uh, prior in the interwar period, but mainly from the Second World War. And that is that having functional democracies is best for us. 
uh, that having alliances that stop these rivalries, particularly in Western Europe and on the Asian peri uh, perimeter, uh, were are really important. Uh, that probably free trade uh, backed up by a regulated capitalism is the best way to bring prosperity uh, to people. Uh, I mean, you kind of go down that list and you can modify it or you can argue some of it, but that's what's being sort of pushed aside, in my opinion, uh, to go into this sort of nationalist populist direction. And as I say, there's, there's are going to be arguments on both sides, but I would say there's a lot of risk uh, in this direction. And if it turns out to be wrong, uh, we will be spending a lot of time trying to reverse it at some point, would be my thought. Yes, sir. Road will affect America's greatness. Will the Chinese New Silk Road be effective, and will it affect our greatness in the world situation? You know, I think potentially, if you have a, a Silk Road which combines uh, the uh, European peninsula of the uh, you know Eurasian landmass, and you combine that the Europe with China. Uh, potentially, you leave the U.S. out, and so uh, potentially, I think it does kind of sideline us, and I think we should pay more attention to it than we do. A um, lot of cynical comments are made every day about oh, the Chinese. They always talk about these grandiose things, but I think you know at some point you have to ask yourself the question: Why are they talking about it so persistently and putting in billions of dollars toward uh, building this? this uh, Belt and uh, and I think the Europeans are very interested in it. They'll become more interested as they see it taking more shape. And so uh, uh, I do think we need to play in that. And I guess my concern is uh, the decision to drop out of TPP. I think is uh, may stand up as the most consequential decision of this past year. We haven't even talked about TPP, but right. I think I think it is. Uh, it has taken us out of the European, I mean, out of the, uh, of the Asian um, picture. And I think in increasingly we're going to see a Europe looking east rather than looking west. So I think it's I huge agree. stuff. And um, I just hope we have the wisdom in Washington to understand that. It was yeah. his, uh, I believe, first executive orders along with the XL pipeline. They were you remember those executive orders? They moved pretty quickly there. That well, uh, the Exxon, you know, the, uh, the pipeline is kind of yesterday's news. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. No and, coal uh, is back. Yeah. Well, not just that, but I mean, we we are self sufficient. Uh, yeah. Uh, good for Canada literally. that we've talked about that, but I don't think it's uh, it's today's news. The uh, people ask uh, often, uh, so what are the alternatives if you're not going to look to Washington for leadership on global warming or on uh, uh, some of this sort of um, internationalism, uh, globalism? Well, to some extent, uh, you can look to China. Uh, she went to Davos uh, and gave a speech on internationalism. He often gives, a, he is uh, concerned about global warming. Uh, he's become kind of this uh, uh, very chic uh, internationalist of the first order. Uh, part of his, his view of where China is going to be and where the leadership is, as opposed to uh, Putin, who is basically uh, uh, taking a much more narrow view, but a very powerful view, as you can see, his, his uh, position is let's overturn these democracies by, uh, by uh, using RT, uh, Russia Today, or Sputnik, yeah. or, or um, online techniques. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. And... Uh, uh, so he, they uh, tremendously different strategies, but I'm impressed by uh, Xi's strategy. It, uh, uh, as I say, he comes off as the uh, the uh, the globalist uh, at the I, moment. You know, I I like to close with the comment that um, several times in my career, the U.S. was sort of counted out. Uh, it was usually over economic issues. If you remember when the Japanese. Uh, uh, swept in and bought Rockefeller Center, and there was oh my God, we're dead. I mean, they've got our Christmas tree and everything, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and lo and behold, it was not such a seminal moment. And so uh, today, I think we're also getting counted out, but not for economic reasons, more for political reasons. And just as we needed to fix that economy and need always to work on on an economy. 
we need to fix some of these political divisions that have weakened us. But uh, I still think, uh, you know, without too much uh, uh, emotion about this, I think the smart money is still on the United States. With that, why don't we stop? It's 7 o'clock. <laughs> I always go with the smart money. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank, thank you, you all.